And hi, welcome to Stone Soup Poetry. We're dead. We're dead in the water. Uh, we just got notification last week that Stone Soup Poetry is no longer being held at the Assemblage Gallery. I don't know if this is a permanent thing, but as effective as, as of May, it is, uh, it is going to be true. Uh, I believe we have one more chance to uh, get together next week. And I'll see if I can figure out a good feature for that. I think this is why I was hesitant in booking features. I think I instinctively knew something was going on because a lot of weird stuff, which is weird, trebly weird because we were, they created new ads for us too. So, I mean, people were, and there's like two other venues that have also, there's at least one other uh, poetry venue that started up there. So I don't know why it all went to hell, but it has, I'm gonna start looking for a location for the uh, 52nd anniversary. I do have a couple of tips in Cambridge from uh, Tony B. So hopefully I will find a place and we can get to, and we can get to work on that. So it's an all open mic night as Stone Soup is dragged, kicking and screaming by the hair through National Poetry Month, even without a physical venue anymore. Again, we are, we are back at it. We are keeping on it. We don't know how to, how, to, how to quit, mostly because we don't know how to win, but we are, we, are, we are pressing on. And I want to continue. We'll do a round robin, two rounds. Hopefully some of our friends will come back. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, I switched on the record button for the YouTube video showing up tomorrow, Thursday by 8.30 or nine o'clock. The, uh, the Facebook deity, otherwise known as the, uh, the bot, uh, the algorithm bots uh, decided to ban me uh, from using Facebook Messenger for the rest for 25 days now. We've started at 30, but now we're at 25. So it's, it's like it was only five days ago. Yes, it was, but um, Facebook sucks. What, am I, what, am I, what can I say? But we're gonna persevere. Just pay attention to Facebook, join my sub stack which will actually have information delivered right to your inbox of the regular email that you probably only check once a month now because Facebook Messenger is so easy. And I'm going to uh, bring it over to the first choice of the Ramnanator 5000 for the open mic. Let's go to Jackie Chow. Uh, Jackie, are you there? Yes, I just got back. Sorry about okay. that. Uh, okay. Uh, is it my turn? Uh, I had to, uh, I live in a care facility. Uh, so sometimes it gets pretty hectic over here. Okay. I'm going to stop video so you can hear me better. Uh, you're frozen, Chad. He is frozen for all of us. Yeah, I think you're, what, I think you're, oh, you're okay. okay, Jack. What did I miss? What did okay. I miss? <laughs> okay. Are you, are you uh, reading? Yes, I'm reading. Okay, read. Is it my turn? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm going to read a poem um, I just wrote. Okay, it's called Red. On the Starbucks patio, Everything around me carries a red tone. I see red and hear red as the siren of a red ambulance blares in my ears. Something tells me they're here to take me away for writing dangerous poems. Red arrow stares from their dark windows pierce my red target back. Maybe someday my red heart would see the color red in a different light. It's good luck, like a red dragonfly dipping into a fountain on a red hot day. Okay, that's one. And then I'm gonna read another one that was inspired by a Picasso poem. Picasso wrote poetry and he wrote a poem called uh, A Lonely Road is 
that I walk, which I think also inspired the Green Day song uh, and inspired me. Uh, it's called The Path. I walk a lonely road because I know no other way. I have broken the bridge which stretches across the lake to the laughing crowd. I walk a lonely road because my lover has let go of my hand and taken a detour to follow the trail of glass. And I know of no street that glistens in the sunlight, only this black asphalt path on which my shadow grows. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Let's go to uh, our next reader. The Ramdenator has chosen Robert Dugelstein um, or Dugelstein. Um, and uh, we better know him better as uh, Robert Fleming, or as I, at least I think we do. I, I think he has a different name every week. Take it away, sir. Could I use the share screen? Yeah, give me one second. I always forget. Thank that. you. Good evening, I'm Robert Fleming a writer and graphic artist and troublemaker from Delaware. Sorry, give me one sec. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to share, I, I entered the Delaware Press Association Writers Communications Contest, and I got two honorable mentions in poetry. This was my first. Before we were wearing, we wore hair keratin like baboons and knocked our chests like gorillas. We wore skin like zebras and bent over to water like wildebeests. We wore muscle like lions and paw swatted flies like bears. We wore bones like swine and dug dirt worms like robins. We wore blood like falcons and taloned on branches like pigeons. We wore fig leaves like chameleons and hid motionless like a rat out preying an ambush snake. You named us Adam and Eve. We were before words. Should I share one more or should I wait? Okay, I'll share one more. Uh, this was the other one that got the honorable mention. United Nations finds pedestrian driver switch equals peace. An ash quarter horse buggy buggies and a Ford Model A four wheeler wheels over orange dust and a red seat Kawasaki and silver sidecar weaves between lanes. And Adam prams a pram with too much Jane wailing and Jill's hairless right arm swings a tan briefcase. And John jogger jogs in red striped white sweatpants. Over 200 years, pedestrians on the side and vehicles in the center. No more. The rules of the road bill is law. Roads will be gray cemented. And Olivia loads a Ford F-150 pickup truck and Jack's 33 inch haired legs walk two miles per hour, Nike step after Nike step. And Eve motors a white Ford F wearing a black headscarf with tail tarring the sidewalk cement. Thank you for letting me share my uh, mentions from the Delaware Press Association. Good for you, Robert, nice job. Now my Stone Soup Crouton poem is gonna have a Jane wailing about Waylon Jennings or something like that. Uh, I thank you for the wordplay idea. Okay, um, <laughs> a plain Jane wailing about Waylon Jennings, anyway. Let us go now to the next person on the open mic. I'm going to bring up uh, Annette Tarplet. 
Hey, y'all. Um, uh, so I share uh, your uh, angst for Facebook uh, jail because I was there once, only for 24 hours. But I know of someone who was there for almost a year. Yeah, so anyway, hopefully you won't be there that long. So I'm in my car. Um, I'm going to share something that I wrote um, a while back. Are we? Am I supposed to share one or two? Uh, well, we do two rounds. So if you have one now, you can do one later. I will. Okay, sure. I'll do that. This is called The Legend of Jack. Down in a meadow with a mountainous view, surrounded by woods, sits a shack. The people who live near this hollow know of the mysterious tenant named Jack. Jack lived out his life with no one. He was alone. He was well known as the county's recluse. He had a still in the backwoods, made his own shine, and frequently partook of his juice. When Jack went to town, people would stare. A bit disheveled he would appear. Once a year, Jack would offer his land a grand celebration with plenty of kegs of beer. It was the only time Jack had company. He had bands playing, plenty of bluegrass. He offered games for the children chasing chickens. Jack would join in and ran mighty fast. Despite his kind gesture, people would ridicule, scoff, and talk behind his back. If he was down and out and in need of help, no one would lend a hand to poor old Jack. Bordering his land was the Russian Creek with lots of rain, waters flowed high on the bank. Little Sally fell in, she couldn't swim, and after she screamed, she quickly sank. Jack came to the rescue, dived in and saved her. People helped pull her onto the grass. That was the last they saw him. The undercurrent took him. He sacrificed his life for the last. Funny how things turn around. No one scoffed anymore. Jack's legend continued on. The musicians got together. They wrote a ballad. Jack lived on through the lyrics of song. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Uh, we're going to move on with uh, Jan Rowe, who was in the audience last week uh, in person, and now she's with us uh, online. Let's welcome her back. Thank you. This is in the um, weekly for the Black Seed Writers every Tuesday morning in uh, Scrode Hall, Cathedral St. Paul, Tremont, Park Street. This is testifying to the budget committee at the State House. On Monday, April 10th, I went to the State House for what turned out to be six hours to advocate for the homeless before Senator Liz. Miranda's budget committee. Senator Liz Miranda's new ran for office after her younger brother was murdered. She brought her sick dad to the city, but he didn't like it. So I was impressed with how uh, uh, Senator Liz Miranda and the state reps listened and responded. I, I went for one couple, once pushing the other, they're homeless in a wheelchair. Uh, the one has one and a half legs and is being pushed by the other and going up the hill to the state house. Woo. And then, uh, since they're homeless, living in a tent outside South Station, they'd have a hard time getting through the metal detector. I have a home. I can leave those items that wouldn't make it. I also went for a friend staying at Pine Street who had pneumonia twice, homeless, but he's getting a room at a Y through St. Francis House. So instead of reading, I looked at each of these uh, panel members and I seem to know a lot like about the horrible eviction record that little kids can get on. I spoke of how middle class fell from 65% with one worker to now it's 45% with two. Forget no child care, forget about owning a house for now. So I ended by inviting them over to Monday lunch, which has been ongoing since 84 when Oregon started to cut housing. Uh, Elizabeth Lennox had a restaurant in Central Square. So I invited uh, them to come across the common to the cathedral, Monday lunch at noon. Thank you.
Thank you, Jan. Who we have next? Oh, we've gone through. Oh, let's go to soon to be departing us, at least in person in Boston. We'll have to do something about that. Let's welcome up Mr. Bill Lewis. Oh, goody, 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 goody. It's my turn. Oh, I'm so excited. Do I get to do a poem? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Chad. Chad, you're just the best ever. Without you, Chad, where would we be? We would, poetry wouldn't exist without Chad for here. I mean, really, we would not take the effort to make Stone Soup happen. And he is our superhero. I mean, he's kind of weird and not so, but he's, he's the one who's there. Oh, you think it's Chad's worth? I thought it was Chad Fur. Well, we'll 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 work on that together. We'll come up with a proper uh, name for the poor fellow. Oh, my niece is nuts. I I understand. Maybe running a marathon. Okay, I understand. For some reason, people want to run marathons, but to fly across the country three thousand miles and then run twenty six and then fly back across the country is not normal. This is not sane, this is not, I love her, but, and then she's gonna do another marathon in two weeks. So she's really sick and, and sad and her, and she has a body like, ah, and um, <clears throat> which inspired me to think about times when I could actually run way back when, once upon a time, my body, I never did marathons, but at least I could run. So Lake Turkana, <laughs> uh, we ran. We just ran because we could. Lying across the desert sand, light of the feather, we ran and ran. I spoke no Turkana, they no Swahili, but our feet did not care because they flew. We flew, we flew together. Three guys out in the desert, lying on their feet, because, because, because we could. The equatorial sun crept up from the horizon, bathing us in its golden light and starting rivulets of sweat down our bodies. We were beautiful. Oh God, we were lovely, slender, tight bodies and muscles, tight little butts. Energy, excitement, and joy, flying near naked across the plains, laughing and dancing and singing, the vibrant youth of humanity. We parted, me to the campsite, they to a village somewhere. We slap hands, hug, yell, laugh, and wave. Young men out for a run, just because we can. Thank you, Mr. Bill. All right, up next, I would like to welcome uh, someone who I should have renamed when she got in here. I won't maintain that, I won't keep up that mistake anymore. Let's welcome up Blackbird. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, guys. Ain't nobody's waving back. Just trying to mainland. <laughs> no, you guys don't miss me. <laughs> I feel like you guys don't miss me anymore. We always miss you, Blackbird. And happy, happy, <laughs> yeah, happy, happy two month birthday, four month birthday to your to your uh, child. Four months. Four months. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's get started. So we're doing two rounds, correct? All right. Cool. Okay. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places, worn out faces. Bright and early for the daily races, going nowhere, going nowhere. And their tears are filling up their glasses, no expression. No expression. Had my head, I want to drown my sorrow. No tomorrow, no tomorrow. 
And I find it kind of funny. I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I ever had. I find it hard to tell you. I find it hard to see. When people run in circles, it's a very, very Assalamu alaikum. Malika assalam. Peace be unto you, to those who have no peace within. I hope you find it soon. Your soul is deteriorating and diminishing from all the stories you told, doing nothing but spreading lies, deceit, spreading hatred, jealousy. I'm talking about society, always worried about others other than themselves, always following in others' footsteps, you know, other than their own, found themselves going in circles, trying to keep up with the latest trend while I sit back, watching them, making a fool of themselves in this mad world that we live in. I'm here just waiting for my children to come home, waiting to break free from this broken system we're living on, live our lives, be happy, but they don't understand that because there is no love in their heart, just bitterness, hatred, closed-mindedness, too busy being caught up in this angry and fearful world that we live in, trying to keep up with the latest trend, mesmerized by the latest fake news, ignoring the real news. For example, like the high rising murdering rates in the black and brown community, either done by police or their brother, or like our mothers and sisters classified as whores as our rapists walk the streets free like proud boys, our children disappearing one by one are abused, but this is America. Look what they're whipping up. They got us crazy now. Don't let them catch you slipping up. Don't let them catch you slipping up. Or you'll be the next hashtag going viral because my love, unfortunately, this is America. All I want is my family, my peace of mind, my freedom. I just wanna know when will this madness end? Will it ever end? And I find it kind of funny. I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you. I find it hard to say. When people run in circles, it's a very, very Bravo, Blackbird. Thank you very much. We're going to keep it going along with uh, Mr. John Wezek, who we haven't seen for quite some time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I miss you being active in the chat. Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, the uh, local uh, poetry society anthology has a lot of poems about the seasons. Uh, so I submitted this one called A Nine Year Old boy's poem about flowers. Crocuses fire, tomahawk, cruise missiles loaded with CBU-87 combined effects munitions that scatter hundreds of bomblets over mom's precious hyacinths. Daffodils open like radar dishes on S-300 surface-to-air missile batteries but sorties of killer bees blast them with AGM-88 harm anti-radiation missiles that home in on transmitters at speeds over Mach 2.0. Before primroses launch scud missiles in retaliation, scrub jays swoop like A-10 thunderbolts and pepper them with depleted uranium rounds from their 30 millimeter GAU-8 rotary auto cannons. Once allied forces achieve air dominance, hummingbirds hover like AH-1 Cobra helicopter gunships ready to fire chin-mounted machine guns at columbines and bluebells. Then M1A1 gophers roll in to mop up survivors, except for snapdragons. Snapdragons are cool. I hate pulling weeds in the garden. A nature hope poem I can get behind. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sean. And up next, 
um, a musical interlude. He hasn't sent an email. He hasn't sent a message saying he's out this week. So he's in this week. Let's welcome up the Polka Stone Soup in Boston Poetry. He's in that class. like we have a couple of uh, people joining us for the last part of the open mic. But first, we're going to segue over to, uh, he'd be normally closing the open mic, but he's going to be an intro to at least one person who has not been here before. Let's welcome up uh, not only a poet, regular open micer to Stone Soup for decades, but also a regular columnist for Oddball. Check out oddballmagazine.com and check out his poem column, It's All One Thing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's James Van Loy. Thanks, Chad. 
Yeah, so uh, because they, uh, you know, this kid uh, released those documents uh, about the Crimean War, uh, who was uh, now probably someplace he's in uh, probably solitary confinement. Um, but in those documents, it's clear that the U.S. did not think that uh, there was any real point in this uh, um, uh, frontal assault that they intend to do to try to break through the land bridge uh, of Crimea. So I thought I should read my piece here called On to Crimea, which is from back in January of this year. So this is called On to Crimea. There already was a Crimean War, of course, 1853 to 56. Ottoman Empire propped up by England and France from faltering stance of doddering old man who finally collapsed in the World One axis of Germany and Austria Hungary when those empires all went down. But back in the 1850s, Crimean War, there was as today, a Baltic battleground, just like that of the Nordstrom attack with Russian ships bottled up in their ports, besieged, protected by guns and walls, Russia was so humiliated by their defeat that they undertook a massive program of industrial scale growth that became the revolution of 1917 and manufacturing system that made the military might that tore the guts right out of Hitler's blitzkrieg. So we've heard over and over again and again about Chamberlain's appeasement at Munich and Hitler keeps on coming back as nationalist this and that, Ho Chi Minh or Saddam Hussein or Libya's Gaddafi justifying one war after another and then another, but no one ever looks back to the world crisis in the year 1848, the year of the revolutions through the 1870s and the Paris Commune in the whirlwind Franco-Prussian war that changed everything. When Germany and Italy became nations instead of a pack of principalities and kingdoms incapable of nation state militaries with dictators like, oh, Mussolini and Hitler. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And now we got two people joining us. Um, I am hoping uh, if Prudence would like, I don't know if Prudence has heard enough and would like to participate in the open mic. If so, she's welcome. She's, she comes to us by way of Carol Weston. So it would be uh, really great to hear her voice tonight. Hi, Chad. Hi, Prudence. Long time. Well, it's good to have you back. Thank you. All right, since you put me on the spot, I guess I will read something I was looking. I think I read this before, but I don't think anyone will remember it. So am I ready to go? Okay. Tired and frustrated that I can't get off the old so familiar Ferris wheel, spinning and spinning, but never reaching across the Jordan. The water has swelled so high, I panicked. It should have been waist deep but I'm nearly drowning in the sea of my own sorrows. Standing between two opinions, left or right, dazed and disoriented, I can't move an inch in either direction. At a standstill, I know what must be because I've been walking so long in familiar territory. New roads are very frightening. Timing has not presented itself, nor will it in any day in the near future. So many variables to consider in order to please the master of the seas. My desires must take back seat unless I want to be completely alone. When father's always right, how do you dispute your own agendas when all along you knew dad's agenda was never flawed since eternity passed? Yet you still want what you want, knowing full well it's not on the itinerary. The heart is a very tricky organ and tends to be adamant in its own desires. Else it skips or not skips to its own beat. That which is correct and acceptable should be a walk in the park when you have the correct attitude and walking in obedience to the Father. The clouds have shifted in a different direction and steered my ship into choppy waters. 
as a non-swimmer wearing a, a child-sized life jacket. I'm afraid to venture even to the front or sides of my boat. Longings keep me up awake at night when I should be fast asleep as a three-month well-fed newborn baby. No tossing or turning, just urges raging within me like a flood. The film only shows one, the film only shows one movie with various scenarios. Slowly tossing my towel overboard, I am barely holding on to the vow I've made time and time again within the last few months. How I want to see that towel, towel soar high in the sky and release the string bidding farewell. So long, my longtime friend. Then stirs a ship 360 in the opposite direction at full throttle. Nothing is hidden from the father and the truth strings one's face with it. It generally pops up at the most inopportune time. Weariness of the storm now has caused dehydration, now faint. The truth will, will carry you far away from the intended course of direction you plug into GPS. But the heart has fainted due to being deferred and will not allow you to breathe properly. Deferment causes the heart to work irregularly and doesn't allow strength to prevail even in the simplest of storm, no matter the category grade. The feet that used to operate as Heinz feet now has ankle issues. Since the heart is operating at half mast, you can't reach the mountaintop of security. Stuck in prisons of your own, defiance frozen and now frostbitten, every movement causes you anguish, whether in the right or wrong direction, because of total lack of surrender. You only see the father's coordinates will cause the storm winds to cease and the wind, the sun to shine in full effect as a beautiful summer's day. A heart deferred indeed makes one sick. How do you change the directions of your ship when the computer board has been damaged in the storm? and now not taking commands due to malfunctions. Dehydrations and impatience has clouded your judgment. So fixing the computer board has become so difficult after it hit in your head during choppy waters. You once were a genius at fixing this issue, but now the slightest concussion has rendered you slightly off kilter. At a loss and worn, you can't be sure of anything and your concussion has giving your spirit a splitting headache. Stubbornness will not make the film stop, nor will it allow the headache to abate and retreat to safe horizons. My spirit is longing to be back to its first love, where the GPS always had the correct coordinates and the best of routes to exotic destinations. Destinations which had always excited even the curious of souls, SOS has been sent through flare gun, but in a dark night far from shore, no one has seen your distress signals. Papa has seen your signals, but in your defiance, you can't move over the, over the seas of your own regrets. How do you draw strength from an empty well? A well now in decay and extremely low. Sailing along in the race of life with defiance becomes a rock that will threaten to destroy your propellers. Leaving you stranded at sea, waiting rescue in the darkest of night with no land in view. Even solidarity of time avails no comfort once confronted with a sea monster, which has always been lurking in the midst of thee, waiting for all your slip ups, needing help, but no one is there to offer it. And in the wilderness of still sea, looking within for the answers that once used to just surface and menace has now taken flight in the middle of the storm. Laying flat backed on my broken ship, there are no connections to life seen or unseen. I must reach deep within to find that connection source that once always guided me to the right paths. And that scene, and I will say I thank you because I kind of forgot all about this time. This was like 2019, but wow. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate that because I've learned a lot. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you so much, Prudence. Um, great, great to have you back. And I'm sure we'll hear more in the weeks to come. Um, what do we have next? Oh. Angelo, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, we can conclude with you and go back to uh, round and go to uh, 
the beginning of uh, round robin, round two. But first, let's hear from Angelo D'Amato, who's had some good work uh, pop up during the- uh, Oh, perfect. I was worried there was only one tonight. All right. Oh, no, you're good. Um, No picture tonight. Chad? What's up? Chad, can I just like go uh, to last uh, thing? I'm just gonna smoke a cigarette real quick. Okay, no problem. So just give me like five, 10 minutes. You got at least that, no problem. Okay, she's got a smoke break, but uh, check out Angela's work on the if you if you're a part of it on the National Poetry Month Stone Soup page, where you can post your poems with impunity and uh, anonymity, and uh, no one no one has to see them, but some often uh, people do. But Angela's put some put some has put some good work on his blog this month. Okay, Angela, take it away. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. You're good. Yeah. Okay, I don't know what just happened. I think you froze. froze. You're freezing, Angelo. All right, cool. Okay, good. A musket on the mantle, dust on the flintlock. Uh, melted candlesticks mounted along the barrel. Silhouettes of mother, of father, of sister, of brother, in copper frames. Dried sprigs of holly, the King James Bible, a flag discolored by gunpowder and British blood. A winter wind seeps through the loose window pane, whistles, promises snow. This is the American homestead. It will endure, yes, endure for millennia. Thank you, Angelo. We're gonna go right. We're gonna go back to start. Collect our two hundred dollars and uh, hit go. And we're gonna go to our uh, the person who started, who was brave enough to start it all off um, for this week's online open mic. Let's welcome back Jackie Chow. Okay. So, how many poems can we read in the second round? I would say two shortish ones, two smallish ones, or one medium one. Two smallish ones or one yeah. medium one. Or if you, or okay. if you haiku, use your, use your judgment. I'll trust Okay, you. I'll read the haiku. Uh, okay, so for uh, this month failed haiku, which is a haiku, uh, actually in Senru journal, uh, the prompt was to write about artwork, haiku or Senru about artwork. Um, and here are a couple. Dysmorphia, all those distorted bodies of the Kooning's women. Van Gogh's daffodils, I tilt my head to be seen in a group photo. The Dove of Peace, Picasso's brush strokes in the cirrus clouds. Crowded pond, feeding shreds of bread to Renoir's ducks. Picasso's blues, I befriend the young man in his self-portrait. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. And I know that failed haiku journal. So thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. We're gonna go now to uh, Rob, back, back to uh, Robert Doodlestein, AKA Robert Fleming. Good evening. I'm going to share some art. So these two um, art pieces were just published in uh, Four Feathers Press, Weather of California, this past week. So this one is called Ozone Hole Repair Trial Number 2001 Band-Aid. And this one is called Ozone Hole Repair Trial Number 10,022 Elmer's Glue. 
And this was accepted tonight for a relatively new uh, lit digital literary magazine out of California called Dark Onus. And this is the Cross Band-Aid Trial Repair. May all of our ozone holes be filled. Thank you so much, Robert. And we're moving on to uh, back to Annette Tarpley, if she's still here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> yes, I'm still here. Um, okay, so I have um, just a couple short ones. And um, this first one was one that I recently did, a challenge for a guest I had on Pop Chat. We both wrote on the same subject. This is the title it came up with. The day the sun did not shine. Every, every day since the beginning of time, the sun has shone daily. It's heavenly rays emitting its warmth and love for humanity, making its glorious entrance in the dawning of the day and showcasing an array of colors upon setting. Always faithful, never failing, its rays continually kissing the earth, warming the beach sands in the summer, melting snow and icicles in the winter. So powerful is the fiery ball in the sky that it nourishes and ignites light into animals, plants, and beasts on earth, occasionally hidden behind the billowing clouds yet penetrating through the veil, relentlessly maintaining its powerful presence until time to relinquish to the fall of night, unveiling in its light the indiscretions of men, for it witnessed the cruelty of mankind. It would extinguish its flame on the day that the sun did not shine. So that is that one. And real quick, I'm going to do another one called Understanding. Pride sometimes includes the way to communication to the extent where understanding is nearly extinct. A poker face is a mask that is at times hard to adopt, thwarted by actions and expressions which may be warped, uh, words easily versed. Yet, Pain may be hidden behind a well-rehearsed facade of riddles, alluding to but not defining that which lurks just below the surface. Understanding is lost in a barrage of messages compiled through writing devoid of emotion and inflections of tone, words lacking speech with the loss of an ear to capture can fall into the depths of silence, which can be deafening in the tracks of the mind. The mind then imagines in its chronicles, images and interpretations that are misguided by a lack of understanding. For the mind has no eyes to see, no ears to hear, no nose to smell, no fingers to touch to detect the coldness or warmth emitted by another's lack of presence. Now alone, trapped within the body of self, apathetic to the world of communication, where an artificial attempt to convey emotion drowns writhing in desire for clarity. Look at me, listen to me, feel who I am, for then you will gain understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. And definitely send a link to you, put in a link for your uh, Facebook group uh, for people who haven't joined yet. All right, thank you. And up next, uh, we're going to bring back Jan Rowe, if she is so willing. She seems to be. Um, this is just a second draft, so it has to be cut back. Governor Lee of Tennessee signed further gun deregulations at Beretta Gun Factory. Money, 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 money. A few days later, his wife's dinner date with an old friend was canceled due to death. The old friend was shot dead, one of the six at the um, religious school. Three nine-year-olds and then three adults, a janitor, an administration, 
and their friend, the substitute teacher. Now, Tennessee, Governor Lee is be signing a red flag bill. I say it's better not to give the gun initially than to try to take it away. Tennessee Rep. Tim Burchett says nothing will be done, nothing can be done, and anyway, he hums schools. Something has been done. In 1994, mass murders went down 43% with the ban. When it expired under the Cheney Bush regime, that went up 245%. Just last year, Japan had three gun deaths. We had over 37,000. <sighs> so then the Tennessee rep Andy Farmer called the peaceful protest of students, parents, grandparents, and clergy a temper tantrum. Practically called one of the three Tennessee martyrs boy. Tell them how to do a bill, stand in line, six deaths, ain't no big deal, boy. Don't you know your place? Get in line. Then the white 60 year old was not ousted with the two black Justins to make it look even worse. Then a Tennessee reps asked the middle school students, well, what kind of gun do you wanna be shot with? Oh. And later, the Tennessee House passed some laws protecting the gun manufacturers. A lot of the good guys in Uvalde had guns. How many kids and teachers' deaths? Some kids experienced their second shooting. Uvalde kids saying what she's going to do next time. The coroner worked until midnight with the pulp. The photos leaked in Tasmania ended to mass murders. Do our photos have to be shown? Thank you, sorry about that, sorry about that. I can't do it with the other group, Black Seed Writers. That's why you love us. Thanks so much, Jan. And up next, uh, another an, an encore from uh, Bill Lewis. Why, thank you so much, Chantrum. <clears throat> My students and I cooperated on writing um, <clears throat> a sonnet. So uh, now I put the sonnet forward for your consideration as to its, its lovely qualities. <clears throat> thy beauty's form and table of my pitting wanting pain, thy tables having an ever so, Yet doth it steal sweet hours from love's delight. To hearts and eyes have drawn thy shape, or love, yet I know it not. Lilies that fester, else mistaking, now my gracious numbers are decayed and of goodly pride. Thy beauty, then she loves me but alone. So, how do you like that? Was that a really great poem? So, we wrote a great big Markov model stuck in all of Shakespeare's sonnets and push the button. And that is the amalgamation of words that came out. Not quite chat GPT, but it was fun. Is that an AI sonnet? I guess you would call it that if you think that is AI, which we shall go with it. And I would allow to take a, a moment to, um, I'm sure that several of us, we're familiar with uh, Ruth Hill, and I'm sure that uh, those of you who were, who knew her well, that love you, girlfriend, and she was 98. Woo! And wow. She was, she was something. So, Ruth, we love you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Bill. <laughs> and now... Uh, I believe she's back from her smoke break. Let's welcome back Blackbird. Hey. Hey guys, what's good? I'm sure you guys have heard this poem before, but I'm going to say it again. Because it's one of my favorites. I am me. 
I've come from a mighty long way to a place where I can finally call home, but it's only temporary. Because you see, I came from a life that was filled with thorns, spent many days trying to water that seed, that seed that I wanted to grow to a beautiful flower and then to a garden, like the Garden of Eden. But each time I water that seed, I see nothing but weed. I see my life as a little child struggling to make her mother happy. Makes herself be a good kid so that she can get a praise from her mother, but her mother is blind by the alcohol, blind by her own life. It's like she's living a life without me. I spent many years living alone, forced to hold everything inside, forced to grow up too quickly and feed for myself because my mom said, I will not always be there for you at the age of nine. But I got so tired of being left behind, I ran away. I ran away to the streets where I found acceptance, did drugs, had sex, almost lost my dignity through men, almost lost the respect for me, almost lost that little girl inside of me that was begging to be free, almost lost my sanity, not knowing pretty soon I was going to find myself with a child. Then the Lord stepped in and gave me a second chance, a chance to be at peace, to be free, sent angels to look after me, sent demons also to teach me about life, taught me never to trust anyone but trust my instincts, and in what I believe, and in what I believe is the truth, the truth about myself, believe in myself, be who I want to be, and in God's eyes, I am me. Thank you. So I um, put in the chat my email, so if you guys want to book me for any virtual you know, performances, I am here, um, and I'm still working on my book, still working on my album. Um, I actually wrote some new poems, writing some new poems, and hopefully I'll be able to share with you get, with that soon. But I had to have to go. So good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Blackbird. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye, bye, Blackbird. Bye. I loved it, fly, Blackbird. Fly away, girl. Say what? I loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, check my email in the chat. Peace. Thanks again. We're going to go now to Mr. John Wesick to, uh, to do his encore piece for the second round of this round robin. Okay, so the title of this is a play on Noam Chomsky's book, Manufacturing Consent. It's called Manufacturing Contempt. Reporters splash blood on front pages, scatter shell casings in editorials, and feed the public ammunition to fire fusillades of outrage. Even though lightning strikes kill as many Americans as mass shootings, these deaths don't make headlines because opinion makers only target guns. Even though the flu kills 10 times more, these deaths don't make headlines because opinion makers only target guns. Even though COVID still kills as many in a day as mass shootings do in a year, shootings get 16 times more coverage because if it bleeds, it leads. Even though Elijah Dickens saved dozens with his pistol, and even though millions defend themselves with firearms, these stories don't make headlines because heroism challenges opinion makers' agenda. Even though arbitrary laws turn responsible gun owners into felons, politicians pile on more when biased reporting misleads the public. Even though a hundred million Americans own firearms, opinion makers muzzle our voices. But when President Ron DeSantis frees January 6 rioters in 2025, even you, dear listener, might feel safer with a gun in the house. Now, I didn't pull the numbers uh, for this poem out of my ass. The numbers of mass shooting deaths come from the 2021 uh, P 
Pew Statistics. The numbers of other deaths come from the CDC. Um, the coverage uh, for the New York came from my counting the number of uh, uh, articles on firearm deaths uh, uh, in, in March and April from the New York Times. They had 31 articles about shootings and two about COVID. And also the number about uh, people defending themselves come from the Gary Keck article called uh, What Do CDC Surveys Say About the Prevalence of Defensive Gun Use? Thank you. Thank you, John. And now our musical interlude with the always ready Ethan Macklin. Thank you, Ethan. And now we go to uh, we go to James Van Loy. I think is ready to go. Hi, Chad. Yeah, so I got uh, I got a poem here. This is one of my labyrinth poems called "Labyrinth as Home." Labyrinth as Home. Even as peculiar, particular child, I love always loved form, as if the stroke of a bat. The arc of ball was more, ever so much more than the score or indeed the whole game. We could play and play for long days of hours, but when it was all over and we kicked the can and so come over with Rover or finally made it home in the end zone, then we remember not victory or defeat who won or lost or even who hit the winning home run, but just the way the ball and the bat and the hands and the eyes all came together as if by an act of God or just the law of primal universe. I lived my whole life for those wondrous arcs and curves when the happenstance of daily existence just coalesced in form of poem or physical performance piece. And now like a child juggling object from hand to hand for sheer joy of absent-minded repetition that no social, privilege, social privileges or honors or material rewards, no sexual favors, or especially 
monetary bonus can match the ecstasy of form coming and going, arching, coming back to the center from which it came. There are smiles that make us happy. There are smiles that make us blue. There are smiles that steal away the teardrops as the sunbeams steal away the dew. There are smiles that have a tender meaning that the eyes of love alone may see. And the dials that fill my life with sunshine are the smiles that you give to me. And now if uh, Prudence, oh, <laughs> we might have one last uh, contributor coming in, but for now, uh, Prudence, if you'd like to read some more, you're more than welcome to. One second, Carol. One second. Prudence, are you there? I'm there, I'm here. Oh, I'm, awesome. I don't have nothing else to say. <laughs> I'm good. All right, then. All right, then, Angelo, Angelo, I believe you're up, if you're there. There he is. Yes, I am here. I'm just going to keep my video off because I, I don't know what's going on with my connection tonight. Um, so I... I read this. It's part of it's the ending portion of a longer piece um, that was written after Uvalde and was intended to critique the Republican parties and Fox News's uh, exploitation of their audience by filling them with apocalyptic rhetoric and keeping them in fear of government takeovers and all that to justify the purchase of automatic weapons or semi automatic weapons and all that. Um, I'm reading it tonight just because I was inspired by uh, Jan's poem earlier. And also it's kind of a counterpoint, counterpoint to John's. Um, so there's some, there's some graphic language. So just brace yourselves. The masters. We masters lounge on silken thrones and rejoice in the pops of purple grapes. We roll rubies in our palms and tell the people make haste. Make haste, make haste, for the sun is falling soon. Make haste, make haste, hide from the light of the moon. The moon, the moon, the great unblinking eye. The moon, the moon, the master of the sky. We charm in the daytime, we dazzle at noontime. Then we wash our feet of filthy city grime. Give orders, we seize contraband. We point to the bells swung by calloused hands. Be grateful, O oh, impoverished you. Be grateful the Lord remembers you. But at night in the quiet of our rooms, we lay beside our sleeping wives and remember how the dumbstruck gypsies trembled in their city of tombs. How the widows hissed beside the market stalls. How the butchers mashed bloody meat into palatable flavored balls. We've raped the gypsies at the fairs. How the eyes, the eyes, the eyes followed our swishing robes. The ever watching eyes, we never thought we'd care, of paupers, of bakers, of midshipmen, of fiends, of courtesans and prostitutes, of failures and kings, of blacksmiths and erudite psalmists, of gardeners and goblet makers, of nobles and knights, of bishops, bishops and av avidly moral priests. We beseech thee, Lord, spare us their mournful stares. And the hunchbacks, the hunchbacks, who ring the city's bells, the hunchbacks, the hunchbacks we've spared from countless wells. They pull the ropes, they ring the bells. As the moon ascends, they ring the evening bells, the evening bells which always ring as we chew upon the day, the evening bells, the evening bells which we cannot pay. 
for the hunks gawk grateful eyes. They take their rations and murmur their muffled thanks. They pirouette up the ancient rafters to gaze upon the river banks. They revere us, they prostrate before us. And to us, this weakness is deplorable. So we beat them, we whip them, we mock them. We drip poison into their breads, and after the retching's done, still they rise and bow their heads. How we hate the lacerations on their backs and the blood upon their brows. How we sneer at the burns we left when the cattle prods cooked their flesh. But the evening bells ring and ring and ring, and the unblinking eye climbs and climbs and climbs. So we lay our heads upon our wives' sleeping breasts, all hail the mercy of the hunchbacks. Thank you. Nice work, Angela. And now, uh, I know Prudence will be happy to hear from her. Uh, Carol finally made it. She can actually close out the night. Uh, we've been we've been at this since about seven twenty. And now it's 8.30 and Carol joined us. We are, so she can give us an extended, extended, oh, extended open mic set. So Laura, you're all set. I mean, sorry, uh, Carol, you're all set, my bad. Oh, okay. Yes. So uh, 1970, this very first Earth Day, I, uh, was honored to read at John's uh, College, Endicott. And uh, I was given, um, what, five minutes or whatever. And um, so this is what happened for the five minutes for, oh, an entire college. <laughs> First day, Fergus Ironworks. The organ. Iron works depends upon the waterfall, depends upon the force of gravity. The eye depends upon the light, depends upon the sun, the rise and fall of flaming gases. Here depends upon the growth of bone-like structures, pine and flamed with color. Earth depends upon the fall of meteoric dust the layers of what the foot has scuffed and pressed through centuries, the foot in all its forms, from pseudopod to wing. The wheel depends upon the perfect outward pressing of the spokes, the turning of the circle like the flower form or like the sphere we turn upon among the others turning. I depend upon the one beside me who depends upon the one beside him, depend upon the air, depends upon the leaves that shine, depends upon the death of the mouse under the earth putting forth vapors. Leaves that shine depend upon the sun, the ultraviolet rays passing invisibly into them. Explator of the rabbit, fall to earth and flowers form there, Brown and colored leaves fall down to earth. The earth grows higher. Lives that have been fulfilled are buried in the earth. The earth grows higher. On warfare fields, lives that have not been fulfilled, their blood shines brighter as they too are buried. And the earth grows higher. Earth grows higher in its sadness. Earth grows higher in its richness. We walk through the smothering fumes into a danger we cannot smell. We are walking around ourselves and it becomes harder to move because there are so many of us. In gas masks, we walk to the sea side and beseech the waters to help us. We turn around and beseech the earth to come back to us. One of us kneels down on the earth and puts his ear against the soil. 
He hears the voices of the tree roots and the disappearing music of the minerals. He stands up from the soil where he kneels, and he tries to open his mouth with the answer, but the words do not come to him. I'm going to stop there halfway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, Prudence got to listen to you. I'm so glad Prudence is here. Um, and I hope I hope you guys come back uh, for the next online stone soup, which I'm not sure when that's going to be because uh, we might be having a live stone soup on the week of May 1st. I'm going to let people know what's going on. I mean, by live, I mean in person if we have a location and I have to, I have a couple days to figure that out and hopefully we'll find something because the assemblage gallery won't uh, take us anymore or at least isn't taking anyone for a while. They think if they can just pull the rug out from other under us like this with less than two weeks notice, then I'm not sure if we want to keep on with that relationship, but we'll see what we have to do. We can do. And next week we will be gathering in person. Hopefully the feature will be announced in the next day or so. And thank you guys for your patience for that. And I am uh, looking forward to having more shows, having more announcements now that we know where we stand with the gallery, if, if, even if it is not at all. So I'm, I'm looking forward to a change and new propositions. So wish me luck with that. And I wish all you guys luck for the rest of the week. Thanks, time to do the obligatory wave. It was good to have you all on tonight. Thank you guys for being able to track me. Again, Facebook Messenger is making it impossible for me to send messages and links. But uh, with any luck, hopefully we will uh, we'll be able to overcome that adversity. And don't forget, we have the uh, Massachusetts Poetry Festival coming up. I'll be posting on Facebook. For some reason, I can't send messages, but I can still post on Facebook. So stay tuned for more information, more opportunities for uh, Stone Soup. And that's about it. Thank you guys all very much. Thanks to newcomers, old comers. Have yourself the best of nights. Bonsoir tout le monde. <laughs> Take care. We done good, yay, Chad. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Shalom.